diagnostics and varia technique of uh, my experience this is the hospital where i work in now medicover hospital in hyderabad today's discussion highlights are mainly the candidacy criteria each year uh, the candidacy criteria is evolving what i have read during my ms that has changed a lot so it's very important to keep ourselves updated so that we can screen the patients and we can you know refer or prepare them properly a lot of people know about pediatric implants and mostly we discuss about that a lot whereas adult implant um, are mostly not that much highlighted whereas the demand is there a lot in that field as well so i will try to cover that aspect uh, coming to the next uh, points will be like how to evaluate the candidate what is hybrid or eas what are the different electrodes processors how do you select the implant and how do you counsel the parent or the adult recipient about their result and last but not the least will be how to start cochlear implant program let us discuss about a few myths and facts first myth and fact slide is about the parents or the recipients many parents believe that implant surgery is very very risky surgery because it is implanted somewhere here they have a misconception probably it is on the brain so it is our job to uh, clarify that that it's not a risky surgery like brain surgery or cetivia surgery uh, some of them also think it's not that promising they keep asking will my child be able to hear will they really be able to hear so it actually gives excellent result because it is based on science and calculation some believe the self life is poor so self life is not poor the first implant recipient in 1985 uh, has been using the implant for more than 35 years yes sometimes after 10 15 years the implant may stop working but there is solution for that as well the implant can be changed so it is very important to counsel them that when the child is growing that is the golden period that time they should be implanted what will happen after 10 20 years can be uh, tackled at that time because science and technology is evolving in every decades now coming to my favorite topics that what are the myths and facts among the surgeons so today um, the very reason of talking on cochlear implant is uh, to share with you what are the obstacles i have faced and how i have overcome many of you may be fortunate to come from a medical college where regular ci programs are running or many of you have done ci fellowship but for me even though my college has given me excellent uh, hands on surgical training in routine ent surgeries but at that time our college didn't have ci program so i always felt that kind of a vacuum in me that i didn't see the is i didn't learn this but how to enter that was a like a you know like a maze and puzzle for me which i had to solve so the myths are uh, that it needs years of training before you start doing cochlear implant what i would like to say that uh, you cannot learn everything and then start you have to learn get cases do and learn again so learning is a continuous process but the next next myth is that you need very very costly equipment so uh, i also had that notion because most of the workshop and conferences used to show the classical technique of posterior tympanotomy and the surgeons were using uh, you know the high speed drill uh, facial nerve monitor and cn and so forth whereas um, the technique which i learned i was very fortunate to come into touch with uh professor jm hans uh, that was through uh, basically a workshop done in gandhi medical college by dr shobhan babu where he showed both the techniques and i was i was just amazed and so happy to see that dr hans was doing it with such an ease and um, you know uh, smoothly without all this equipment he just did that with routine ear surgery equipment so you need uh instrument of lax that's a myth you can start with your routine ear surgery equipment with little bit of addition which i will show you in another slide if you are a very a surgeon number 3 that you need to work in a very bigger hospital tertiary care center medical college no it's not needed what you need is a good quality microscope a good uh, nursing staff and stability concept in your ot and a good anesthesia team and uh, you need a 
very big team uh yes of course you need a team cochlear implant without an audiologist or an avt therapist is just not possible but you you may not always have everything ready made uh available you have to make that so initial days i i have done like outsource then slowly i have built up relation with the audiologist and they have become my best friend by this time and then you can slowly as your cases go on and you you find interest in the subject you can build a team in house also it is nothing it's not a big deal and the last myth is implant companies don't help the beginner that i have heard so many times that it's a there is monopoly you cannot enter into that it's very difficult they will not give you implant it's not the truth they actually help the beginner surgeon if you are properly trained and they are like they will help you in everything in selecting the electrode in counseling the patient and where to go for training and to bring the mentor surgeon so it's about you if you want to do with the very basic requirement and a good training you can actually start taking the help from the implant companies so my journey started with uh, professor james hans i am always ever ever uh, thankful to him he is the person who made me believe you can do that and his guru's picture is also here professor trifon who is the pioneer for the uh, various technique uh, which we'll discuss uh, later on coming to the candidacy let's make it very simple that the first candidacy uh, criteria is selected by audiological basis then medical whether the child or the person has anything to do or any other comorbidities and then psychological whether there is any mental retardation autism or you know or like adhd anything like that and very very important to understand the patient or the family choice sometimes i have seen teenagers or young adults where the family is very much interested for the ci but the person actually does not want that maybe they are already part of the deaf and dumb community or whatever be the reason so it's important to understand whom you are implanting what that person wants it's not about what the doctor feel or what the family feels all the time so candidacy i have described in age group basis so 12 to 24 months the can it is the fda approval is for bilateral profound hearing loss where there is a lack of auditory skill development and the hearing aid benefit is bare minimum there are many questionnaires to ask about that which the parents can fill up what about after 2 years so 2 years to 17 years the criteria is severe to profound so now 12 to 24 it was only profound after 24 we are including severe bilateral sensory neural hearing loss also and minimum hearing aid benefit which means the word recognition score is less than 30% let us just brush up our knowledge about this you know severe profound moderately severe you can see the just go through the graph here you can make out that this part is like 70 to 90 is the severe hearing loss and below now 90 is the uh, profound hearing loss according to that if i show the candidacy in this graph this red zone uh, is the uh, they are the candidate for cochlear implant so as i told in the beginning that these audiometric criteria are evolving over the decades when it started 1990 it was uh, profound and then it came like severe to profound and now we can also implant children as young as 9 months old and single sided deafness as well there are also indication of cochlear implant in asymmetric hearing loss in children of 5 years and older with profound sensory neural hearing loss in poorer ear this is the audiometric criteria for adults so 1985 it was approved only for age group 18 and above for bilateral profound loss after 10 years they included severe to profound loss after another 10 years they included moderate to profound loss so you see the criteria are expanding slowly and in the year 2014 eas or hybrid implant uh, was approved and in 2019 single sided deafness was also approved for the age of Five years or more. This is the uh, criteria for single-sided deafness. That the affected ear, the graph should be around here, below seventy. 
and the contractor ear has to have a good amount of hearing which is above 60. The indication is mild to moderate hearing loss in contralateral ear with hearing threshold that fall within the shaded area in the chart. Functional auditory nerve should be there. There should be a history of prior use of hearing aids if appropriate. Coming to the hybrid implant or acoustic stimulus. So what is this thing? This is indicated for people who have a good amount of hearing uh, ability in the low frequency, but the high frequency hearing is grossly affected. So in this case, uh, this is the graph, the red color you can see. If the PTA graph is falling into this, they will be benefited from the hybrid implant. And the down graph where I have shown the yellow color is the CI indication and the gray color is the hybrid uh, indication. And there are some common overlap areas here. So how does it work? Okay, basically the low frequency sound will be detected by the microphone of the audio processor, like the hearing aid part. The hearing aid part will take care of the low frequency sound here. And the high frequency sound, they will be detected by the microphone of the audio processor and will be sent into the cochlea by the cochlear implant technology. So the low frequency part is hearing aid technology and the high frequency part is the CI technology. That's why it's called the hybrid. What are the common criteria? That there should not be any medical contraindication. There should be the uh, education level or the parents should understand that how important is the AVT therapy. They should not be living in a far away area. They should, it should be accessible. Initially, many parents say, yeah, you do the implant, we'll follow everything, but it doesn't happen always. So try to understand what is their physical status, where do they live, how they are going to access the AVT therapy. All this discussion should come prior to surgery itself. And very important is realistic expectation and a motivated parent. So I have implanted a few case at the age of four years or five years. So I, I spend a huge amount of time along with my audiologist and AVT therapist to explain them that, look, your child is already four years, so the golden period is lost. How much speech development will come, we are not sure, but what best we can do for them? Because many times I see a lot of foreign patients, especially from you know Somalia, Djibouti, or other, in, even Middle East, they come at this age, and probably by that time, they have huge amount of money, and they ask me to do, you go for bilateral implant, do the best quality implant, but they think after implantation, the child will go home and start speaking. That doesn't work like that. So you have to hammer them repeatedly, repeatedly, because after the implant, they will deny. They will not. So it has to be written that what is the age, what, what, what really we can do, and there should be a balance between that. It's very important to understand that PTA or beta is not everything. So we have to start and learn to think beyond the audiogram. So the candidacy basically depends on sensation and perception. These two things are very different. Sensation can be judged by audiogram, that whether you have the sense of sound or not, are you getting the sound or not? But perception is very different. Perception is understanding, processing of the sound, which is a much more complex process, starting from the cochlea to the auditory nerve to the auditory cortex. And the perception is judged by speech recognition. So same PTA does not necessarily mean the same speech recognition or the same perception. This is very important to understand the post-lingual criteria. So in 2020, this paper has, uh, you know, brought a lot of uh, new thought process into this, that who are the candidates who should be referred, post-lingual cases, adult cases for CI. So it is known as 6060 guideline for CI referral, wherein they have spoken about that if the Puritan audiometry is showing at the level of 500, 1 and 2 kilohertz level, that the hearing uh, impairment is more than 60 decibel, and if without hearing aid, their speech recognition score is less than 60%, then they are a very good candidate for cochlear implant. Let us just uh, talk about all the implant systems to which we have, because as you start dealing with neurotology and you 
plan for CI, we also have to have a little broader knowledge and view about the other systems. CI and EAS, we have already discussed about. There are middle ear implants, there are bone bridge implant, there are bone conduction ad hair, which is just like a sticker. You know, it will stick here, no surgery, nothing but excellent result. And of course, there is auditory brain stem implant. So where the child doesn't have cochlea or there is no nerve at all, no question of implant, then ABI will remain the only option. Now, how the cochlear implant works? Cochlear implant has an outer part, which is the audio processor, and the inner part, which is the uh, recipient, and then receiver, which is the receiver, and of course the electrode. The electrode goes into the cochlea. So the externally or uh, microphone and the audio processor will have lots of design and varieties. Again, electrode will also be different in different companies. And even in one company, there will be uh, difference in the length of the electrode, in the diameter, and in the curvature as well. Candidacy for difficult cases. So a child with mental retardation or autism, many times the pediatric neurologist sends such cases to me or to any end for that matter. So will you exclude them for implant or will you take them? There is no contraindication to do CI in these kids. We can do implant, but the, again, the expectation has to be realistic and there should be a graded uh, prognosis explained to them if the parents are very, very motivated and the autism or whatever the problem is of mild degree, we can do the implant. What about the different kind of internal ear anomalies? Can we do uh, implant in common cavity? Yes, we can do. Only we have to talk to the implant company which electrode is best suitable in that case. You cannot always do with the standard electrode. You have to keep standby and have to give thought process about proper selection of the electrode. Mondinous deformity, yes, we can do that as well. Again, uh, you can select in the, like in medal, we can, there is form 24 or standard electrode depending on the cochlear duct length. Can we do implant in uh, Michael's aplasia? Of course not, because there is no inner ear structure. So we can probably think for ABI. Coming to the inner ear malformation. Now, again, it's my personal perspective. I'm telling not about everybody. So whenever I have been to uh, you know, CI discussions and workshop, I have heard a lot of uh, lecture and slides on this topic, inner ear malformation. And in the beginning, if you start reading from this, it will uh, make you a little shaky that, okay, can I ever understand uh, these deformities well from the scan? If I don't understand this, how can I even be CI surgeon? So let's come out of that fear factor because of one point that everybody does not have in area malformation. Just look at the statistics. If you look about uh, what percentage have the malformation, among the congenital hearing loss patients, it is only 20%. 80% of the children will have only membranous labyrinth affected. So their bony cochlea will be absolutely normal. There will be no problem in routine cochlear implant. The surgical technique will be the pretty straightforward of the thing. Only 20% of them will have bony labyrinth affected. So if you can't differentiate in the CT MRI, not a big deal. You can sit down with expert radiologist. You can take second opinion. You can get your mentor and then you can do as a team. So it's not a prerequisite that you have to understand everything and then you start the journey. Now, what are the challenges expected to do in such cases during on table that there may be CSF gusher, there may be risk of meningitis, there may be abnormal branches of facial nerve and of course choosing the correct uh, electrode, timing of surgery, all these considerations should come into uh, when you are going to address such cases. Can a child with ANSD be implanted with CI? This is a big controversial topic. So it, it varies in opinion. It varies from audiologist to audiologist, surgeon to surgeon. But the answer is yes. Now, what else we can do for ANSD? Of course, if they are getting some amount of benefit of with hearing aid and can manage with lip reading, then you can probably defer CI, but uh, it is sad enough to say that they don't get much benefit from hearing aids at all. Even though the PTA will show near normal hearing, 
but their speech reception is a big big issues for them they don't understand what is being said in front of them so what is the option for them ci is the only option left for them which they have to accept now if ci will not give 100% result which will be there for outer hair cell dysfunction definitely but if any improvement to be expected it is the only option so why not go for that now simultaneous versus sequential ci now I myself, uh, mostly when I see young kids like one year, one and a half year or two years, I always, always counsel for simultaneous bilateral implant because there are proofs and many papers that which shows that simultaneous implant actually help a lot in early speech and language development. But if there is issues like the parents are not ready with the money to buy both the implants or the whatever reason or you are not comfortable doing two simultaneously or the parents want it to be done sequentially, then also you have to counsel that lesser the gap is better the outcome that you should not wait for four five years to implant the other year. Try to do the other year also as early as possible. Coming to the postlingual candidate. So this was a child of uh, nine years age who actually came to me with a uh, common cold, nose block and all, not for hearing issues at all. And when I saw the child is wearing bilateral hearing aids, but absolutely dependent on the lip reading. That was the corona time probably. So I was in mask and as I removed the mask, he's answering me. As I put on the mask, he's just blank. So then I started inquiring about the parents that what was the hearing status, how many years he has been using the machine, what is his school performance. So I came to understand that the child is not getting benefit from the hearing aids at all, but probably uh, they have not been counseled for CI properly. So they have been rejecting at early age. Now, as the child is nine years and mature enough to understand, we started counseling parents and the child, which took couple of months and he saw the other recipients and then the boy was very much interested for the implant himself as well as the parents so he was implanted bilateral and he is doing much much better he is very very happy actually so this was his uh, audiograms you can see profound hearing loss and how is the aided audiogram and this is the child who who has given me the permission to put the pictures so i am putting and uh, so if the child is smart enough and is eager to undergo, it is always, always good to do CI at this age as well. Coming to different kind of electrodes. So again, there is no reason to uh, get confused by seeing this picture. There are many, many electrodes there. Uh, as I told you, their uh, length and their uh, diameter may be different and there are some electrodes which automatically will seal the CSF gusher or leak if there is. So you can always go through the different uh, companies website to look into that to read details or whichever city you practice you can call uh, the respective company person representative they will be there will be no resistance from this side they will come and train you that was some uh, pictures from the medal I just took from the websites and this is from the cochlear cochlear slim a straight electrode and you can see beautifully everything is written here that what is the tip diameter 0.3 and what is the diameter here 0.6 so you can calculate that what should be your uh, cochlear stomy or whatever round in, round window insertion or cochlear stomy the entry point should be at least uh, this 0.6 thing should go in so probably it should be around 0.8 and then there will be markings as well. These white markings will be there, these two markings. So if your electrode goes up to the second marking, then you are happy at whatever length uh, the company has made to go into the cochlear second turn, you have properly inserted that. This is one kind of handle. So when during insertion, again, the company people will train you, your mentor will train you that which direction the handle should be there. So these are just technical details which while doing people can learn it's not a robot science or anything like that and then, then there is yeah it's not there are different kind of uh, processors as well uh, some pictures I have put from the uh, cochlear processor this is the nuclear 7 sound processor then this is Kanso 2 which is wireless and more handy lightweight and sophisticated the similar one is Rondo 2 in the medal and this is the recent addition in cochlear profile series 
uh, which is called the slim modular electrode. Now, among all these varieties, how do you select the implant? What are the main criteria a surgeon should have? And even the parents sometimes blandly ask, can you tell me that what are the uh, one, two, three things we should see in the implant companies? When they do their own research also, you have to help them. So number one is reliability of the implant. How many years? Is it a time-tested company? How many years they are in the market? What is the reliability? Number two is MRI compatibility. Some implants will be 1.5 Tesla compatible. Some will be 3 Tesla. Number three are there varieties of electrode arrays. If you are dealing with a special case, which uh, electrode will be best suitable for the candidate? And then if you are working on a very uh, uh, small child, like one year or less than one year, and the skull bone thickness is not good enough, then you have to probably select an implant which where the thickness is minimum. About the audio processor designs, it depends on what environment the child will be growing or for an adult, what is the profession? Uh, depending on that, we can select the audio processor. And of course, uh, the most important is the budget. What is the budget of the parents uh, to spend on the implant? Depending on all these things, we can select the implant. Now, coming to the result prediction. Result prediction is... Uh, the result prediction depends on previous auditory experience and whether the child is prelingual or postlingual. The gap between onset of deafness and implantation. Suppose... Uh, we see a lot of patients from uh, developing countries or African countries who come to our institute in Medicova with uh, war injuries, bomb blast, and they lost hearing on both the ears. Now, if they are coming to me within one year or six months, CI will be very good for them. But if they are coming after decades, then there is a controversy how much uh, they will be benefited. If the person has been using hearing aids in the past, it always gives better result in CI. And what has been the communication method? If a person is already used by sign language or too much attached to lip reading, it is very difficult uh, to dissociate them from the practice communication method and put them on the auditory scale. All these are important and most important is the age of implant, especially in congenital or prelingual acquired hearing loss. So early is the better. That is the rule. Now, expectation versus outcome. This is just like you know playing in a seesaw. It is very, very important and uh, spend a lot of time in this. And I have put this seesaw picture because here the four seats are for parents, Candidate, audiologist, and surgeon. Always, always take the audiologist uh, from the beginning part of the discussion because they are the main person to navigate through the journey. So CI surgery is just like getting the you know ticket, train ticket, and getting into the train and reaching the destination is the main thing, which is uh, way beyond the surgery. Early is the better because of uh, there are phonological critical period in our brain. Our brain has certain plasticity. So if the auditory cortex is not getting uh, any kind of stimulus for many months or years, then it is very, very difficult. Even after implant, the child will hear, but the speech center may be silent. The development of speech will be very, very difficult. Another indication is post meningitis. If post meningitis ossification starts, then the CI result will be poor. So it's very important that after meningitis, the implant be done as early as possible. A little details about the audiology assessment. So suppose one of you get a patient with a child who is not speaking at the age of two years or two and a half years, not responding to the sound, and the parents are asking you what next to do. Many times they ask, does the child have tongue tie? Does the child doesn't have uvula? Is there any problem in voice box? This is the common misbelief in the society. 90% of the parents or people, common men, don't know that a child don't speak because they don't hear. 
even educated people they don't know they believe something wrong in the throat so you have to first tell them that the hearing test is the very first test to know why there is speech delay you have to motivate them to do the audiological assessment the number one is vera number two is auto acoustic emission if needed few cases will need assr as well to detect residual hearing and impedance audiometry i do uh, uh, routinely just before surgery because children very easily get asom ome during urti and you don't want to operate at that point that's why impedance in vera what you want to see that if there is no typical waveform even at 90 decibel that means there is profound sensory neural hearing loss if it is bilateral then the child is a ci candidate what we want to know from oa if the OA is, is absent in one way as a CI surgeon, if the beta and OA both are absent, I will be happy because OA absent means outer hair cell function is the uh, problem area and you can overcome that by putting cochlear implant. Whereas beta absent and OA present means it is auditory neuropathy, it will be much more challenging to deal with. So the role of OA is, the first role is screening. It is the most commonly used screening tool for neonate. If the OA is passed, the, they, we can discharge the child that probably the hearing is normal. If the OA is abnormal, then they send to ENT doctor. Now, once the beta is absent, you do OA. Already I told you that OA absent means it is outer hair cell dysfunction. OA present means it is not outer hair cell problem. It is auditory uh, neuropathy spectrum disorder, so which needs further assessment and discussion. Coming to radiology assessment, so always go for both CT temporal bone and MRI cochlea and brain because they both have two different purpose. When done together, you get all the knowledge before doing the implant. In CT temporal bone, what we want to see? So we see the bony cochlear anatomy, how is the master pneumatization, how is the facial recess, the canal wall thickness, the skull bone thickness, where is the facial nerve, about um, the dural plate and sinus plate, the round window position, and if there is any dilated vestibular or cochlear aqueduct, so that you are prepared whether there will be any CSF gusher or user. Now, why the MRI? The MRI cochlea is to see the internal auditory canal, how is the eighth cranial nerve, what is the uh, feature in the membranous labyrinth, whether there is any ossification, any other abnormality, and also to look into the brain if there is any gross brain pathology. Now, a uh, lot of people ask me that when you are not doing practice in an institute, when you practice in a private clinic and you send your scans in different other centers, what uh, particular term you will use to write for uh, CI uh, candidacy evaluation to the radiologist. So you can just mention to your radiologist friend that the CT scan should have it, the HRCT, of course, HRCT with 0.5 millimeter thickness will give you all the knowledge about that. And if possible, it is not mandatory. If the software is there, they can give you a 3D reconstruction of the cochlea and the absolute length measurement. But without that also, you can do with a 0.5 millimeter thickness CT scan. What about the MRI? Is 3 Tesla MRI mandatory? No, 1.5 Tesla MRI is also good enough. What you need in that, you need thin sections, preferably 0.4 to 0.7 mm, and heavily weighted T2 images are uh, ideal to look into the fluid-filled membranous labyrinth and in the nerve, and how to see the uh, nerve in the internal auditory canal, that they will do some kind of high-quality multiplanar reformatted images in a particular plane, where they can absolutely give you the nerve measurement. So first we have to make use of our brain to be habituated to see the inner ear structures in the MRI. So did I put this slide that look in the diagram and try to correlate here. First is the internal auditory canal. Here this is the internal auditory canal. And the nerve which is above is the, this is the cochlear implant and this is the inferior vestibular nerve. And you can see the lateral semicircular canal here, the vestibule here, and the cochlea here. The thumb rule is, this is a normal anatomy, so easy to understand, but when there will be abnormal inner ear malformation, uh, it becomes a little tricky. 
so the uh, the structure which is superior to or above to internal auditory canal will be the cochlear part and which is down will be the vestibular part in this also you can see the turns of cochlea so this is a normal cochlea now let us see how the uh, 3d images of cochlea and the internal auditory canal looks like so this is the 3d image this is the cochlear turns and all the semicircular canals and the vestibule and this is the cross section of the uh, internal auditory canal which is called oblique sagittal reformated image wherein they can show you the all the nerves and measure their thickness how does labyrinthitis ossificans look like so if you see the normal cochlea your brain is already trained in that if you see something different than that in the color if the color this this area should be black right in that if you see any gray shadow then you know probably it is labyrinthitis ossificans this one is more prominent than this side this picture is probably autogenic labyrinthitis ossificans. It can be from meningitis or it can be from ear infection as well because you can see some haziness in the uh, middle ear and mastoid area as well. This is the classification of labyrinthitis ossificans. Here it is grade 0, then grade 1, this is 2, this is 3, and here it is completely ossified. So CT scan, I would say, gives quite a good and beautiful idea view about this thing. You can also confirm from the MRI. There also you will see loss of the fluid intensity. The bright intensity, which is otherwise seen in T2 weighted, that will be uh, you know defective or lost there. This is the normal cochlea already shown, and this is this is the abnormal cochlea. The turns have not developed properly. It's look like a balloon here and there, but it's not common cavity because the cochlea and the vestibules are separated, and this is the internal auditory meatus. Now, stenosed internal auditory canal, is it a contraindication for uh, cochlear implant? Again, a debated topic. Look at this picture, MRI. This side is a stenotic, right side is a stenotic internal auditory canal and left side it is hypoplastic, almost it is not existing. So what I learned from uh, Dr. Hans is that probably someone of his stature or who has been doing implant for many, many decades, can take on such cases, but for a beginner, it is better not to give any false promise or take such cases. Now, the reasoning from the seniors or the professors are that even though the scan may show that there is no internal artery canal or it is very narrow or hypoplastic, there may be some nerve fibers still present, cochlear nerve coming into the inner ear. So it is always worth trying CI rather than going for auditory brain stem implant because anyway, EDI never gives good result like CI. So even if a few fibers are there in the canal, CI can actually work wonderfully in these cases as well. What other radiology we have to understand to start CI is the post-op X-ray, which is easy to understand. You can see this is one of my bilateral implant candidate and you can see this is the electrode and which is gone nicely up to the second and the epical turn. Now coming to the surgery technique, the age old technique is of course posterior tympanotomy and some other surgeons have tried many other techniques in that transcanal technique is well established now worldwide and in India we have a various group by now. There are many many surgeons who are doing in various technique in last uh, 10, 20 years. So I am a I am trained in the varia technique, which is the transcanal insertion. So I will talk a little bit about that. Now, where from it came, where it started, it started from Professor Trifon in Greece, and uh, he started doing this technique, and he has shown that it is very safe technique, it is reprodu reproducible, and the results are equally good. This is his original paper uh, published in uh, 2000. Two. Now, why varia technique? Why my, I chose varia technique? I can tell you those points which are also there in other papers published on this technique. First of all, which look very interesting to me is the view of the cochlea. Now, maybe 10, 20 years back, if you think about stephy surgery or ear surgery, there were not much scope of endoscopic ear surgery, right? All the surgeries were done microscopic. All the techniques were taught like that, that how will you, you know, move the microscope, how will you move the head so that you can see the pyramid, 
how to reach the sinus tympani but as endoscopic ear surgery evolved many of these so much discussed topic became so simple you just put the endoscope you can see all the hidden areas similarly i i was also thinking why we have to see round window in such a crooked way that you make the uh, open the facial recess and you know uh, do lot of things and then do the drilling and then see the round window there must be something easier way to look into that and seeing the varia technique i felt yes this is it because you don't need to have the keyhole vision you are having a beautiful wide view of cochlea the basal turn of the cochlea is in front of you the round window is in front of you it gives an um, amazing experience and confidence how to put the electrode and that is the best part of the varia technique what are the other theoretical advantages many of uh, you may or may not agree but it is just to give you the knowledge no debate so the people say that it is more physiological because you are not opening up the antrum you are just doing minimal drill work number 2 uh, there is no fear of facial nerve injury again some people say it is a blind technique there will be facial nerve injury no if you understand the philosophy of the technique how the tunnel is made it is absolutely impossible to injure the facial nerve uh, number 4 is minimal instrumentation as i have already discussed that for varia you don't need high speed drill facial nerve monitor number 4 is less surgical time so as i told that i do love to do bilateral simultaneous implant it is very important to finish the surgery fast because in a small child you cannot uh, keep them under ga unnecessarily for long time and then it is suitable for all cochlear anomalies you can do cochlear drilling through that and you can control csf gusher or user it is very good technique for hypo pneumatic mastoid and where the dura is low the sinus is forward lying it is the best technique okay i didn't explain the scan uh, let's spend a little time here this is the axial view and you can see that this is the external auditory canal this is the facial canal and this is the supramatal well which we create to place the extra electrode and this is the tunnel uh, through which the electrode goes this is taken from professor trifon's original paper the picture is from that this is the first contact at the apex this is the evidence of deep insertion it is also very important that if your electrode stops only in the basal elect, uh, the basal turn the result will not be good more the length is covered of the cochlea it is better result you get because we all know about the tonotopic arrangement of the cochlea so you touch all the frequencies what are the instruments required for varia technique so what when i planned to start implant and i got my first case what did i buy i just bought one contrangle handpiece and one tunnel making handpiece with a guard i had a simple marathon drill that's enough did i have very costly microscope no at that point of time i didn't even have zeiss microscope which i have the luxury now so with a simple microscope with which i used to do tympanoplasty and adding two hand pieces which are not very costly at all and marathon drill uh, motor i started my journey and anybody can do that and did i buy any other operative equipment yes a few bars 0.6 0.8 1.2 uh, diamond bars even if you don't buy that you can get from the implant surgical toolkit other forceps both cochlea and medal provide their beautiful forceps for the electrode insertion so for a varia surgeon there is no more investment in the instruments this is the endoral insertion after endoral insertion the canal canal uh, posterior canal straightening is done and then is the tunnel making for the electrode this is the uh, hand piece specially designed for the electrode tunnel making which is a guard here so that the guard and the bar distance is such that when you are making the tunnel there will be a edge shelling edge shelling thin of the external auditory canal you can actually see movement of the bar i will show you in the surgical video later and that's how it makes you safe not to injure the facial nerve if it is properly done it will never injure the facial nerve and here is the cochleostomy in the basal turn of cochlea so the tunnel will be such directed from the superior side to the towards the middle ear that when you place the electrode it will directly go into the cochleostomy now the cochleostomy is being done this is a 
uh, picture I have taken from Professor Hans with his permission that there was a study in Australia where he shown the varia technique and then they did a sequential cross section of the inner ear and the tunnel all throughout to see what is the uh, possibility of facial nerve injury in this technique and it was very interesting that the electrode has always been far away from the facial nerve and when I started my learning process I did lot of tunneling in different portion in a cadaveric bone in a facon bone in front of arm side and then open the facial nerve completely decompressed to see where i am so it was a quite a bit of distance it is rather difficult to injury uh, do the injury of facial nerve in this technique a few surgical steps from my uh, last case i have put here okay, Can I just close and reopen? Then I think the video will play. Yeah, please. Yes. Hmm. Or else you can play the raw video file from the explorer. Yeah, 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 that's also better. Yeah, if it doesn't play this time, I will, at the end of presentation, I will show the original videos. A few more slides only left, and we are already 8.20, so I will first finish the theory part and the presentation. Yeah, okay, it's running now. This is the tunnel making part. The implant bed has been created here. This is the supramatal well. And the tunnel will go from 11 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And you can see I can, I'm just checking with a small stillet and there is eggshell thinning of the external artery canal here. The canal has been straightened as well. I have already marked the cochleostomy site so that my tunnel is in exact direction to the cochleostomy. While doing this, a lot of irrigation is needed. Otherwise the bone dust will block the tunnel. This is the cochleostomy part. So this, this view actually is what I love really. So if somebody does stepidotomy or routine tympanoplasty, we all know to elevate the TM flap. Similarly, the TM flap has been elevated. One cotton ball I have kept there to preserve the flap, not to injure. And you are seeing the round window beautifully and the basal term of cochlea and then doing the cochleostomy there. There is no issue of the uh, visual field. I have thinned out the cochleostomy site, confirmed, and now enlarging. And even the inside of the lumen is beautifully thin. At this point, steroid irrigation is given. So now once the tunnel is done and the cochleostomy is over, and then is the final part of the electrode insertion. If the tunnel is made properly, it easily directly goes into the cochleostomy. That is the first white marking, second white marking. After that, smooth insertion with beautiful vision. All these forceps you are seeing, they are provided by the company only. After doing this, the extra electrode will be coiled here in the supramatal well. The tympanometal flap will be repositioned and the wound will be closed in layer. The soft tissue work video I have not shown here, but anyone is interested, you can see my YouTube channel. I have uploaded Professor Hans' original video where from beginning to end without editing, which took only 45 minutes for him, though I take a lot of time, but he takes only 45 minutes and all the steps are given there. So after the surgery, uh, routinely NRT is done. 
there are difference in terminologies from company to company cochlear company calls it nrt and they check all the 22 electrodes are working or not the metal use different term they say auto art but basically the function is the same it is the nerve response telemetry again their technology uh, is little different and number of electrodes are also different and they will also check all these things can be if your audiologist are already well trained uh, sometimes my audiologist do sometime the company uh, provides the software and they come into the ot actually and check all these things now what are the possible complications of ci surgery no surgery is without complication uh, number one is facial nerve palsy can be there there can be csf leak there can be meningitis that is why we always immunize the children before implant against h influenza meningococcus and pneumococcus there can be device failure and there can be explantation in the future my last few slides may look little uh, out of the topic but why did i put that that look at the statistics of hearing disability 5% of the world population is suffering from disabling hearing loss 466 million people among them 34 million are children by the year 2050 if we project these statistics it will be more than 900 million people there are a lot of people suffering from noise induced hearing uh, loss 83% gap between the need of hearing aid user and the actual uh, who need the hearing aids and look at this picture the global burden deeper is the color more is the number so you can see the southeast asia india is part of that we have maximum number of hearing impairment people and maximum number of congenital hearing impaired children the reason of putting this slide is that we need to be more uh, cautious about uh, all these hearing loss things sometimes in our routine practice we get lost by doing routine surgery septoplasty face tympanoplasty mastoid we miss to counsel for noise induced hearing loss we miss to think beyond the pure audiometry we just see and sometime refer to audiologist so we need to spend little more time for uh, in the neurotology and think about this and my take home message about after this today's presentation is that we need more ci surgeons it it is not uh, rational that only a few people in a state will do ci surgeries and it is something uh, people cannot do no we can all do ci surgeries the person who is well trained to do tympanoplasty mastoidectomy can easily learn ci surgery only thing needed is a proper training a little more training in the ci technology and handling of the things and a team so as new surgeon should come up also the audiologist should come up to train more people to deal with ci candidates to select candidates to refer cases instead of spending time in trying with the hearing aids and losing the golden period refer them early to the ci surgeons we need more ngo therapists there should be more from the government scheme ngo and insurance coverage should start in this country where we are mainly lacking by that only we can bridge the gap between the actual demand of ci candidates and actually who are receiving so what are the criteria of uh, ci surgeons there has to be lot of passion to do cochlear implant you have to spend huge amount of time for counseling and follow up visits and you have to be ready to be like their family doctor because the relation is going to be lifelong with you the child and their family or an adult recipient will always come back to you whether it is a problem of the implant whether it is a problem in the magnet or battery or anything forget about there may not be problem related to the surgery surgery may be excellent but every single and simple problem they will look at you that you will probably help them so if if you are ready to build up that relationship and to take that kind of responsibility then you can be a ci surgeon just a matter of your passion that you want to learn it and you want to start it and the last but not the least that you have to have a good patient parents of candidate who trusts you so what i feel for anything like 
Dr. Jankiram said in the last workshop, Dr. Sriharsh was there, that if somebody just passes out MS and says, I want to be skull wave surgeon, he will laugh at it. Likewise, you cannot be CI surgeon just after passing out. You have to do everything. You have to do a good face, a good tympanoplasty, a good MLS surgery. You have to build up a certain good name and the trust factor. Then only you, you can enter into the next level of doing CI. So it's very important to learn everything, all the basics of uh, ENT practice, and then love and learn one subspecialty. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was really informative. So the, we have opened up, opened up the uh, unmute option. So any of the audience who wish to interact uh, can unmute and uh, 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 clear your. Hello. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Santosh. I just have two doubts. Can yes, Dr. Santosh. Uh, first thing, while while in the varia technique, you are uh, opening the tunnel with a guard, right? Yes. Uh, where exactly, like? After you're drilling the total mass start, only the superficial air cells to the antrum or where you're no, drilling? We don't open the antrum at all. We do just superficial drilling good enough mm. to place the extra electrode. There is no need to open the antrum. That okay, then where? Only for okay. the extra electrode. Okay, and where where exactly do you drill, uh, make the tunnel? Like any uh, uh, the position to make the tunnel? Yes. Like, uh, position is if it is uh, right here then the position will be from 11 o'clock to 9 o'clock so okay. first the cochleostomy marking is done and then you mark the 11 o'clock if you see the tunnel as the uh, round thing 11 to 9 will be there for the right ear and if it is for the left ear then it will be like uh, 5 o'clock okay. 3 o'clock okay and it's a tangential okay. thing it's not straight Okay, and uh, if there is any EAC injury at that point, what? How do you? How will we manage? Long process of incus. No, no, no. If the bony canal wall, we are making the tunnel along the posterior canal wall, right? Yes. Uh, if there is a bony canal wall injury, how how will we manage? Yes, it happens. Initially, it happens. There will be small hole. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You can put some bone cement, or when you are doing that uh, supramedial part drilling, you can keep some bone dust, bone cement or bone dust. You can put there. If it is a small injury, nothing will happen. No, if it is a, a, a injury at the level of annulus. At the level of annulus. Same yes. thing is a small injury, but that bird diameter itself is 1.2. So it doesn't cause any harm at all. Okay. Your TM flap is intact. No, you can also sometimes the TM flap get uh, with the repeated use of suction. It many times oh. happened to me. There will be small nick in the TM flap, like what happens in stapes sometimes. I just put a okay. fascia in that and put it back. Okay. Okay. And the second doubt is, if there is a soft failure of the device by after the varia technique, how will we do the re explantation and reimplantation? What? What is the question? Um, like post implant, there can be device failure, right? Device failure. Okay. Yeah. Um, after, if the patient comes with a soft failure, how, how, what is the plan for explantation and reimplantation? The same way, like uh, how you are put the implant. Okay, here I would like to tell you one thing. Now uh, the varia technique, because in India, a lot of surgeons are doing varia and few people have done their, their own modification, but I am trained with the Hansar's original technique, which I follow. Hansar does not put any securing suture. He uh, always trends no, to, no, no. Uh, I will come no, to your no, no. point because this is also important. That's why I started from there. Okay, so okay. he says that you spend a lot of time in making the bed properly. Do it such nicely that the implant will uh, fix there. It will not go anywhere. He just make use of the periosteal pocket. So we don't put any securing suture pin, anything. So of course, explantation is also easy. You bring it out from the periosteal no, no, pocket no, no. and take it out no. from the tunnel. So uh, sorry. I actually want to know generally what is this if there is an a device failure we need to drill the bone which forms around the electrode to remove the electrode and to put a new electrode right explantation and implantation if it is with the varia how how will we do it like we are going if a patient post implant comes with the device failure and we, we are planning to an explantation and reimplantation of a new device how we how are we going to Remove that electrode and put a new electrode. 
reimplantation will be through the same tunnel you are going to drill the same tunnel yes like uh, like how yes, okay you are going to drill along the tunnel you have to use a burr again microscope and drill the yes. uh, if it is if it is closed yeah How do you do the uh, varia technique in if there are facial anomalies? Okay, see, I have myself not seen any facial nerve anomalies, but the technique is the same because if there are facial anomalies. How will you do a varia technique? Facial nerve anomalies does not uh, cause you any problem in making the tunnel because you are going through the facial recess. So if it is actually it is better if there is any anomalous branching and all. This tunnel is much more secure. It will never injure any of the facial anomalies. What is the incidence of facial palsy in varia technique? Again, I have to tell my mentors uh, data only. Dr. Hans has done 3000 of implants. He had only two facial, not paralysis, a uh, few days, man, I mean, temporary facial palsy, which he can recover in 3000 implants. You can go through what the about technology. about, about uh, area technique in congenital anomalies, inner ear anomalies. Inner ear anomalies I have done in varia technique. So there is it doesn't uh, there is no difference actually. Your tunnel is the same and your coclostomy is the same. You just have to select the different electrodes. So I have done with the REST. There was monomist deformity, we have done with the REST. In fact, I feel it is it is better because you are able to see the inner ear. It is open as you elevate the TM flap. It is all in front of your eyes. So there is no modification needed. But Even you, are if opening you... The, you are opening the uh, external canal and entering. So you are already there is a uh, root of infection inside. By... How? So do you get infection in stepis? Then why do you uh, enter into the canal in stepis? Then we should not do that as no, well. No, stepis is different. This is an implant. This, oh, it's, it's, a model. It it's not a stapes why, surgery. Why it is different? You are doing in a, in fact, I think stapes is more tricky because a person has already some hearing and you are promising better hearing. If you, in, if you introduce an infection, you will destroy that. You will make it a dead ear. It is even more promising. You are not talking about dead ear. We are talking about the infection of the implant. Fine. If, if that you are able to elevate the TM flap without any fear, what is the fear factor here? If infection is to be invited, that will come from unsterile equipment, that will come from faulty technique, that can happen here also. Most of the complication come from implant explantation. There will be soft tissue, gapping, or there will so be... So, with, with your large incisions, you do have infections? Correct. This is a very small incision. This incision goes from here to here. Very, very small compared to posterior, postural... Postural incisions are also very small. See, I am not here to do any debate with you. If the real question is there, I can answer. The answer is, if we are not afraid of infection in stapid surgery, there is no chance of infection here as well. And we are talking on data. I already told you about 3,000 cases data. If you are interested, you read about more papers. And now, if I show you, uh, there is a, I didn't uh, put that slide in my presentation. Every state has at least four or five various surgeons in India now. I am not the only person, okay? So you can see that database and nobody saw that the infection rate is more because of opening the canal. Whether you open the canal or not, there is no question of infection in that. You clean the canal properly, you take all the precaution. How does it matter whether you are entering the middle or canal? Then every year surgery will end up with infection. I understand implant is costly, we are doing in small children, so we are afraid. But we don't want post of infection in any ear surgeries, but we are routinely elevating. Are we getting infection in tympanoplasty or other things because we elevate the flap? So this is a wrong concept, and uh, it has yeah, all over the all over the world. People are doing facial recess approach. Why are we doing area technique work? Correct. Whenever any new technique comes, it comes like that. When the endoscopic stapes surgery came, the same things were said. So it will the time will tell. We should be open. We should be open. I am not telling that posterior tympanotomy is wrong 
or this is best i am not telling this is best i felt this is the technique for me and which is giving result which is time tested if you like prostate implant you go for that why all over the world people are doing that there is no answer and time will say that as the technology is evolving i think in another decade robotic surgery will come robotic surgery may take over the implant surgery completely there are some surgeons who use crm in the table there are many surgeons who have put if you see the complication rates that the implant has the electrode has gone into wrong level it has gone into internal auditory uh, sorry uh, internal carotid artery canal it has gone into hypoplastic uh, hypotympanic uh, cells it has gone into eustachian tube all these complications are from prostate implantatory technique because the visibility is not good of course in an expert surgeon hands it will not happen but i felt for a beginner the visibility and level of confidence is much much more in varia technique you will not put into the wrong place uh, uh, what is the angle of like how do you insert the electrode for the uh, in the varia technique i already showed the video i didn't understand angle means what generally we from the antero superior to postero inferior if you insert the electrode it goes into the skeleton pani that is the yes yes that is for the soft and i think to go around the main feature the feature okay how like you got my like well, you do you follow any angle of insertion like uh, uh, this this is so you have to understand the basal turn concept so when you see the basal turn where it is meeting the so what we see we see what is the turn of the basal turn and where it is meeting the round window and then we are uh, drilling on the top of that anteriorly so that you are directly entering into the uh, target area so you don't have to be there is no chance of uh, going into the uh, because it's an a, a end on view end on view when you elevate the flap uh, okay. postro postro if you are postro inferiorly directed you will be in the skeleton then uh that angle of insertion will be missing so or it that, it will because this in that, that you can orient yourself by seeing the round window and the membrane and then you can uh, decide on the cochleostomy okay. that comes with the practice One question, please. Why not going directly into the round window instead of having cochleostomy when you are inserting the electrode? Okay, there there are some various surgeons who are doing round window insertion as well nowadays. Uh, you, if you go through the tunnel, you can also put the electrode through round window. But uh, I have not been trained in that way. I am more comfortable in cochleostomy. because my tunnel and cochleostomy lies in such a direct plane that i don't have to do extra drilling to see the round window and i can just directly put it inside with much confidence but there are various surgeons who do combined technique like transcanal tunnel but putting through the round window it is possible we have few questions in the chat section <coughs> uh, by dr wahid akhtar is there any difference of varia technique for residual hearing for residual hearing we have to select the proper electrode and proper implant or the proper device technique wise whether varia or prostate implantatomy there is no special or i don't know there is anything special in that uh dr neha wants to speak a few words ma please go ahead uh, sir, uh, sorry i have one more one more question sorry can i ask one more question please go ahead sir uh in meningitis post meningitis cases also it's the same approach or or it, it, it does it change with the varia approach like uh, second time second time cochleostomy and uh, double electrode insertion if it's the same thing or it does it change with it is so the procedure is still the same that you elevate the tm flap you see the cochlea and then you do the drilling work okay and uh, like uh, risk of cochleostomy uh, say uh, they say round window insertion is much safer instead of cochleostomy what is your comment on that 
uh, this is a topic uh, much discussed about that whether the drilling is causing any uh, injury in the hair cell loss, hair cell loss. Yeah, yeah, outer hair cell so um, the reasoning from my side is like even for round window membrane insertion do we always see the round window many times the round window membrane will be under the hood and to see that we also drill in that area as well right no no we 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 only drill the round window niche covering the round window membrane but we don't drill near to the generally when you go through the post fit anatomy no uh, for every various technique where even when the round window is visible you are doing the cochleostomy sound is it right? still there sorry the drilling related sound yeah. and the injury is still there that is not uh, that in, in and there are also reasoning that round window insertion in in that the baffle effect will go so all kind of no 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 uh, no no yeah, nah, my point is if, if you it is grade win grade one round window you do the cochleostomy or you do the round window insertion i always do cochleostomy uh, because uh, because there is a risk more risk with the cochleostomy that's why i want to just know that yeah 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 we have to see number of more papers I, maybe your point is valid i don't know but i do cochleostomy and still my mentor's result which i believe that is good with cochleostomy but this theoretical uh, discussion what you pointed out is correct i have to read more about that in that but if if i agree in that also round window insertion also i can do with this technique yeah okay thank you good evening ma'am good evening Neha here, ma'am. I, uh, I have, so I'm Dr. Neha and I've been training under Dr. Sampurna for six months now. And for everyone listening, I would just like everyone to know that initially when I got out of ENT, I was very afraid to take up any fellowships in otology or cochlear implant or anything, thinking that that is so complicated and, you know, it's it's not going to happen with my hands. So I initially started just, you know, training with the basic cases. And once I started working with ma'am, she has made things so simple. And the one cochlear implant, which I have assisted with her, uh, it felt like, you know, anyone can do it, just like how she's explained in her uh, uh, presentation right now. And I don't think young surgeon should be afraid to take up any kind of challenge, because if we don't learn it now, we will never be able to learn it. So I just want to say a big thank you to ma'am for making things, things so simple. That's, a, that's a great no, no, I, I just want to add a point. It was a nice presentation. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I, yes, hello. Yes, tell me. Uh, but uh, uh, posterior tympanotomy, if it is properly trained, it will be a very easy approach. If you, you I, I understood your point, like end on view, cochlea, it will make more content. But why it posterior tympanotomy, it will be, Complete uh, respect for classical technique. I have no problem with that. I somehow. No, just, I want to add on it. I'm not saying anything. Uh, oh, it depends on the surgeon. Whoever is comforted, what technique, they have to follow it. That is, yeah, that is yeah. the final thing. That's, yeah. I want to say it's that uh, posterior tympanotomy is a simp uh, simple technique. It, uh, if you can master it, you can see the round window. If you do the wide proper uh, cochlea, uh, proper uh, uh, facial research exposure. That's just I want to ask. Do you use a facial nerve monitor, Dr. Santosh? No, no, we don't. We never used a facial nerve monitor. We use no. facial nerve monitor when there is an anomalous facial nerve. Then facial nerve. Correct, ah. correct. But I want to add, if there is a, when the varia, if the varia you, you are using, if there is any device failure, you will have to drill and open up. Then it will become a problematic thing. I, 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 I will. I, uh, so truly, I don't have much. Uh, my first hand experience is not there in that. I have to ask uh, the because, surgeons because, what uh, it, uh, it, uh, because with the facial recess, explore, uh, when there is any device failure, you can drill and you can open it. I'm not sure how if the varia is done and if there is a fa device failure, if you have to do an explantation and reimplantation, how it is going to work out? I am also not sure. If, I have you, seen I, that videos, but I know people are doing left and right in Hyderabad. You know, Dr. Meghnad is one of the uh, varia surgeon who does in only varia technique. And then Dr. Hans, Dr. Rajesh Vishwakarma. No, I'm, I'm, 
no, no I'm, I'm not i don't have first experience so i don't know i am not telling but they're doing uh, explantation and re-implantation and they're successfully doing so there must be some technique i will know and let you know that how they are doing sure I mean, that's, that's what i want to know the surgeon does not uh, cause any problem to them or they don't convert to other technique that time they are in that technique only they are doing everything okay see anything is depends on the uh, at what you are comfortable with. That's exactly. it. But I need to know, it should address all the aspects of the patient. That's Correct. what I want. Correct. My suggestion is whoever is learning whichever technique from the mentor, first 10 year, blindly follow your mentor. Don't try to do any modification or anything new. Blindly follow, but at the same time, keep your eyes and mind open to new techniques or if any surgeon is doing something new, try to understand the philosophy behind that. Be open and see everything, explore everything. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I, 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 I'm not a cochlear implant surgeon as per se, but um, having worked with uh, Jan Kram, sir, uh, I was lucky to assist uh, around 70 to 80 implants. And he is one of the rare surgeons who does both the techniques. And uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, there's no rational uh, which technique he chooses, and it's just random. Uh, every surgeon he can do that <laughs> so he used to ask us uh, just before surgery which technique do you want to see and okay. it was our choice and i have seen advantages and disadvantages in both the techniques okay. and uh, it's as both of you were speaking uh, it's just a pure surgeon's choice and it is how they have got trained okay. yeah thank you uh, one and all thank you ma'am uh, for uh, sharing your experience yeah bye